Have any of you ever felt bad for the villagers in Resident Evil 4 Remake? On my fourth playthrough of slaughtering every living being between the police car and the jet ski, I started to realise that these people were actually the victims of this story. They didn't deserve to be murdered in cold blood. So it got me thinking, could you beat Resident Evil 4 Remake with zero kills? In pursuit of this challenge, the boys dropped me off at the village and from here on out, I was going to be the hero Pueblo didn't need, nor the one it deserved. I was going to save these innocent souls oh, no. from the clutches of evil, Sadler, the mastermind behind all of this. Which, I'll admit, initially doesn't go very well as we immediately break this man's neck after he jumps out and scares us. But after investigating the basement, he makes a miraculous recovery, which is a huge relief, as failing this challenge in the first 30 seconds would have been extremely embarrassing. We avoid killing anyone else on the road to Pueblo and slip on our heelys to glide through the village until the ding dong goes off. We also secure the life force of this run, our first flash grenade. Having the ability to stun these boys and girls was going to be huge and would be where all of our resources would be spent. Everything's pretty straightforward from here to be honest. We disable the dynamites at the windmill and shack areas to make sure nobody jumps into them and have to hope and pray to god that these troglodytes don't throw dynamite in between anyone's toes. We meet Luis and Mendez before closing out chapter 1 with zero kills. So far, so good. Chapter 2 opens up with us grabbing our gear back and meeting with the merchant, but things take an immediate dive downhill as we get to the mountainside. This place was teeming with dynamite throwers, which presented a headache. Sadly, there was no justice in Pueblo, and any kills made throughout my run, even if I wasn't responsible for them, would be attributed to me. Whilst unfair and definitely illegal, we need to be very tactical on how we approach this. By keeping our distance and ensuring any thrown sticks of death were thrown off the map or into a safe area, Today drained me. We're able to grab the crank and leave the mountainside with zero kills. We arrive at the chief's cabin who catches us rifling for his underwear drawer, which he's obviously less than happy about. He grabs us by the neck and tells us he knows what we're trying to do here and that our efforts to save the village were futile. We would never make it to the castle alive and we would have to make a choice to either kill him or die ourselves. Ooh, you're hard. Despite the big guy's threat ringing in our ears, we secure zero kills in chapter two, dodge some grandpas and meet the next bane of our lives, the Molotov guys. These guys offered the same problem as their dynamite colleagues, albeit with the added benefit of the smell of burnt hair and human skin filling the air instead. A shocking moment unfolds in the quarry as this dog somehow catches a crow mid-flight and kills it. I thought nothing of it at the time, but at the end of the chapter it turns out the crows actually count as kills as well. So with another thing added to the list of items we needed to worry about, we have to reset the chapter and chase all the birds away to make sure none of them are caught. The swap section was a bit of a pain, it was literally a convention of everyone I hated most. Dynamite strapped to the walls and the hammer pig who would regularly do a crash bandicoot and kill everyone in a 45 meter radius. With a bit of trial and error, we managed to disable the dynamite and as long as we kept the pig boy at a safe distance, he just kept trying to catch us up and didn't attack. With the petrol now secured, we make it to the challenger's inevitable doom, Del Lago. Unfortunately for us, the big lizard cannot be skipped. No matter how many police officers we feed to him, he refuses to yield us a safe path across the river. With tears filling my eyes, we take out our harpoon, tell Del Largo to look at the flowers, and launch one straight into his anus, killing him instantly and finishing chapter 3 with our first kill. Despite our failure, we'll carry on anyway and we'll see what the minimum amount of kills needed to complete the run was. After waking up from our lakeside nap, we find some cave drawings that show us that the white walkers are coming, but also that we need to find two statues to get the church key. Retrieving the first one was no biggie, but the second one, however, is a slight biggie. Dodging the molotovs and dynamites in this section took some playing with, but eventually the move was to flash this first guy to stop him throwing his molotov and bait out this dynamite throw so it lands somewhere safe and out of the way. We then solve the puzzle and retrieve the stone head before restarting our recent checkpoint to reset the enemy positions, which makes it much easier to slip back past them all to the boat kill free. Oh no! no. <laughs> On our way back to the church, we're stopped in our tracks by the big bouncer who sadly becomes our registered kill number two of the run. After this, we meet Ashley for the first time and with her now in tow, we'd be expected to protect and rescue her if she was ever manhandled, which was fine. A well-timed flash or a little 9mm to the ankle seemed to work just fine, ensuring no lasting damage was caused to our villagers. However, our desire for peace was soon to be ruined as we reached the cabin. We team up with Luis and have to defend ourselves from the village onslaught. However, as mentioned previously, all kills would count as if they were ours. So when Luis started murdering all the innocent villagers as they illegally entered his home, we took the blame for these. Despite there being no evidence of me touching a single enemy during this section, in the eyes of the Pueblo justice system, I was responsible for Luis's actions and was guilty by association. Flash grenades didn't last long enough to keep them outside from harm's way, and running around and keeping the crowd upstairs from Luis didn't really work either, as the new spawns were immediately killed as they came through the downstairs window. I'm dying. 
me. We finished the cabin segment with a devastating 14 kills. I wasn't satisfied with this result, however, and on investigation, I found a strat which I thought might help. Using the rifle and scope, you can actually use them to clip into walls, which for the cabin section meant that I could clip into this wall on the balcony. Enemies would no longer recognize Leon as in play and wouldn't attack you, but this didn't completely protect them from Luis and his lust for blood. On our second try, we reduced the murder rate down to 11 kills, which was only three lives saved, but still a saving nonetheless. Chapter 6 brings about a series of traps laid to stop me and Ashley from escaping, but using our superior agility, we make it safely through to the next area. The crank to unlock the door we need is within our grasp, just as two chainsaws come soaring through the wall. Wall. These women were the most beautiful individuals I'd ever seen in my life, but one of them steals the crank we need and refuses to give it back. Despite not wanting any trouble, trouble appeared to have found us. To retrieve the crank, we're forced to murder our new girlfriend, giving us kill number 14. But did this innocent woman really need to die? Being a pacifist means that murderous problems require peaceful solutions. After some investigating, if you time it right, you can actually glitch through this wall with a rifle, using the autosave that happens when you reach this door and allowing you to walk all the way around the arena. Once you make it past the crank door, you find the chainsaw girls just hanging out here waiting for me to steal their crank so they can make their dramatic entrance, meaning we can leave them in peace and save their lives in the process. You gonna make me act up. I love you. Despite us saving a kill here, there was one man who was going to make good on his promise, Archbishop Mendez. He tells me it's time to make that choice, for me to choose, my life or his. With a heavy heart, we draw a gun and make our choice. It was time- Whoa, 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 hang on. What if there was another choice here as well? What if peace was an option for those who wanted it? This is big brain time. On discussing this problem with the merchant, he offers to smuggle me through the mountainside pass and around Mendez for a few passatas, which was perfect. We completely avoid the fight and even pass Mendez on the road to the castle. I looked up into his deep brown and red eyes and said that I hoped he would understand and respect why I chose peace. I asked that he didn't waste the life that we had- Don't leave me! In a minute! Somehow, some way, against all the odds, we had managed to close out chapter 6 with zero kills. At the castle, however, with red demons lurking, cannons firing, and heads bursting, getting through this segment kill free seemed like an impossible task. After a few attempts, we preserve everyone's life here with a few well-placed loads and flashes before Salazar greets us and proclaims that whilst we may have turned Mendes to the light side of the force, he wouldn't be so easily swayed. Good, and he could good. We had his whole entourage to handle here and a garrison <laughs> waiting for us in the dungeon ahead. How many kills would we have to rack up here? Well, would you believe me if I said none? The rifle glitch that we use in the cabin and at the Chainsaw Sisters can actually be used to click through certain locked doors and teleport me to the other side. It means that we can open locked doors early and avoid complete sections of the game. In this case, this includes the Garador, who can leave peacefully screaming in the basement and press on to our biggest challenge yet, the water room. The first section is pretty straightforward, we jump down and grab the wheel to lower the platform. The next section, where Ashley needs to go and crank the two platforms up from the water, however, is less straightforward. We have a number of enemies trying to abduct her, two cranks that needed shifting, and a limited amount of flashes. Flashes, however, didn't seem to be as strong as I thought they were going to be here. Ashley refuses to move past enemies that are in her way, doing? even when they're flashed, meaning that we can't make any progress to the second crank. We could try and flash enemies multiple times in the hope that we could burn their eyes out of their sockets so that they would wander aimlessly back away from Ashley to clear her path. However, we burnt through all of our flashes and made no progress. It was also problematic as we were burning Ashley's eyes out as well, causing her to drop the crank and reset the progress every time we flashed. With my F-bomb counter now reaching critically high levels, we had to go back to the drawing board here. This would require some serious planning, and after some thought, I had an idea. Sunglasses. This section hadn't driven me insane, I promise. If you give Ashley or Leon any of the sunglasses cosmetics from the extras menu, it actually prevents you both from being stunned or blinded from the flash grenades. With Ashley now looking like Ray Charles, we'd let her finish the first crank and then allow this cultist to abduct her, who took her not to the closest door, but to the furthest door which was the closest to our next crank. I'd flash at the perfect moment twice, stunning the crew behind Ashley and the guy who had just dropped her. She'd rush to the crank, I'd flash again, and she wouldn't get stunned because of her sunglasses and boom, we had it. The secret formula for a pacifist water room. And with that, we close out chapter 7, again miraculously recording zero kills. Chapter 8, however, wasn't going to be as kind to us. We joined the weekly Plaga's anonymous meeting and asked to borrow the red guy's lantern to get through the puzzle up ahead. Apparently, like Marguerite from Resident Evil 7, he was very protective of his puzzle lantern piece and refused to give it up. Well, okay, you asked for it, and we forcibly steal the lantern from him, causing kill number 14. We almost increase that count up to 15 when we try and chop Ada's head straight off her neck, but then we really do take it up to 15 when we have to fight the castle cave troll. Saruman. Initially, I was going to kill him with the cannon, but with him constantly throwing rocks at us like an annoying child, 
he was causing collateral damage along the way, which we just couldn't risk. So with that in mind, we bring out the big guns. For the bargain price of 50,000 potatoes, the merchant gives us the get out of jail free launcher, allowing us to remove him from the equation early on and close out the chapter at only two kills. We catch up with Ashley and strategically place a couple of treats around the maze to avoid the dogs. Unfortunately, the zealots aren't interested in the dog treats, so we have to rescue Ashley a few times before we make it to the Chimera puzzle. The serpent's head was peacefully retrieved, and for the goat's head, you can actually throw a pre-cutscene flashbang here, which presents the helmet guy from lowering the bridge, allowing us to grab the piece with ease. I'm going to do what's called a pro-gamer move. However, the lion's head requires more than just brains. It requires blood. The blood of these seven Plaga Knights, unfortunately. There's no current way to skip this section, so we have to commit night genocide taking seven souls of us to the underworld. Leon murders a ton of people in this cutscene, but luckily for us, these don't count, and we close out Ashley's section with zero kills, the power of Christ compels you, taking the total for chapter eight to just the seven knights. Rip. Next on the menu was the Novi section, which was fairly easy. We just get some mild corrosion to the face, but washing my eyes in the emergency eye bath was enough to prevent any lasting damage. However, like at the end of Logan, we get a double Hugh Jackman kill in the next room. These two have stashed the unicorn horns up their prison wallets, and they require retrieving to get through the next door. To avoid any unwanted casualties on our book of murder, we ring the bell in the corner over here and throw free nades at them both, leaving everyone else untouched. The same couldn't be said, however, for the priceless antique bell we just rang, which gets completely disintegrated. We get thrown down the naughty hole by Vidugu, who follows us down and is apparently doing a Kill Leon challenge. I'm about to end this man's whole career. But we avoid him until the lift comes, meeting up with Luis to tell him all about how we'd only killed two people in Chapter 10. Now, clearing the cave section would be tough. The main area leading to the dynamite we needed to clear the way was full of explosions, fire, and chainsaws. It would take a miracle to make it through here unscathed, and I'm just not about that life. Like all my real life problems, I just threw money at it and buy the rocket launcher to clear out our way through the debris instead. Afterwards, it was time to melt down the two El Gigantes and mold them into necklaces to sell to the merchant, giving us an extra 100,000 pesetas, but costing us two lives in the process. On the adrenaline fueled minecart ride, I was able to avoid killing any of the archers using my trademark dodge techniques. The archers were stunned, and we ascend to what can only be described as the peak male form. We also deter the Doctor from chainsawing our nipples off, sparing his life, but we do have to kill the two dynamite men who run at us on the tracks, taking our total to four. We run through the Novi section and wait patiently for Luis, who, as the lift goes up, begins talking to us about what we were trying to accomplish here in Pueblo. He says that whilst trying not to kill anyone was admirable, there was a key piece of information that I needed to know before getting to Sadler. But before he could finish his sentence, Krauser turns him into a kebab. To avenge Sancho, we shave off Krauser's eyebrows, but you can imagine my jaw-dropping shock when the chapter finishes out with five kills instead of four. I went back and replayed this chapter 20 times thinking I couldn't count, but I got 5 kills every time. Who was this mystery 5th person? Was it this guy who crashes his minecart right at the start? Was it Salvador? <sighs> Why was I being punished for crimes I hadn't committed? Anyways, we won't dwell on this just yet, and we'll circle back to this at the end of the video, as we have a nipple twister of a section coming up, the Clock Tower. This place was like the Los Illuminados mecca, there were so many people here, and the insta-kill booby traps were certainly not a welcome addition. We blow the flamethrower head up easily enough, but the giant spike balls of steel were proving problematic. To these cultists, these instant death balls were like what bleach and tie pods were to children. For some reason, they just had to have it. I tried everything to get up here kill free, but it was proving difficult. After a quick brainstorming session, I had the solution. I rolled up my sleeves, cracked my knuckles, and gathered everyone up behind the flamethrower. I also flashed these two goons up here so that they'd aggro down to me to ensure we avoid any accidents on the way up. As I turned to face my horde of would-be murderers, I tried reasoning with these people, trying to speak to their hearts. I said that I wasn't their enemy, it was Sadler, and that if we joined forces together... Alright, well I guess words aren't going to cut it here, so we placed a flash inside their eyeballs instead, ran upstairs at the speed of light, reflashing them as I got to this point to keep them downstairs, and pre-flashing the metal head on the lever to prevent it from deploying another ball. And by some act of God, we've made it. The crowd gather below me as I ascend like Jesus Christ himself, and we have to make sure that nobody makes it onto the platform as we go up. Just one person would take us overweight, and we wouldn't be able to move again until we killed them. We dish out more permanent retina damage to all the would-be jumpers, which means that nobody could catch us up, reaching the top kill free. <coughs> Unfortunately though, Salazar was right. Despite being able to get through to Mender's and change his ways, some people were just beyond redemption, and Salazar was that person. We had no choice but to murder this child and add kill number 30 to our tally. We order an Uber boat and Ada swings by to drop us off at the island, and we reach another ball lake of a section, the island entrance. These guys are back to having Molotovs, explosive arrows, and these Terminator machines that just kill everyone on sight. These machines, however, were the biggest problem. When moving the turrets to make way to the entrance, the enemies didn't seem to recognise that the turrets were the new targeting area, so when running back to their spawns after I leave this area, they'd run straight back into the turrets and die after I'd left, which only became apparent after I finished the chapter. There was no way I was going to accept this. Eventually, I was able to get this section down perfectly, 
quickly. I'd run in, change this turret, run over and change the other turret once everyone was safely clear of the sensors. I'd then lure everyone back over to the first turret and reset its position to avoid any unlucky stragglers getting caught out. Once everyone was in position and safely tucked up here, I'd flash everyone to keep them here, sprint up the ramp and flash them again from the tunnel above before rushing to the rocket launcher section where everyone would have hopefully have despawned by then. And it seemed to work. Nice. The rocket launcher guy always shoots this first shot, so I make sure he doesn't kill anyone, flash everyone up top to make sure the dynamite man doesn't have an accident, and we pass the human torch in the kitchen. The regenerator doors make our nightmares come true, and we're forced to kill the wrench smuggler so we can upgrade the keycard. Again, a few flashes here are required to prevent the dynamite guys from killing their colleagues, as they all rush in to stop me from getting the keycard. Closing out chapter 13, we finish with two kills, which really should be one, but I'll come back to this at the end again. With Ashley now in tow, we reach this gate. Now, for those that don't know, this is where we need to get in order to progress the level, this lift. But to get here, we have to do a huge circle, fighting off regenerators, solving puzzles, sacrificing our firstborn child, and somehow avoiding any kills in the wrecking ball section, just to make it to here, where the first door connects to. Now, there is a shortcut you can use at the wrecking ball section. If you rocket launcher and grenade the crack in the wall, Ashley will break through at first try, saving valuable time in this section. However, I had another race up my sleeve, our old faithful, the rifle. We use the door glitch and teleport through to the other side of the door and open it from the lock side, skipping this entire area. Let's find another way. How about new? We ride up the lift before we lose Ashley again and we start our tango with Krauser. Now, I already knew how this was going to play out. Krauser would claim that he would sooner die than let us through the gate to Ashley and we would oblige him, incurring another kill. But what I wasn't prepared for was the random two additional kills that I got added to my counter. This was a problem. I had no idea who it was that I killed. I replayed this section three or four times with the same outcome, and there were no murders apart from Krauser. What foul devilry was at play here? On my fifth playthrough of this section, I made a realisation of something I had been doing without even thinking about. I have been shooting Krauser during these sections to get him to leave me alone, after which he flashes us directly into our corneas and does a Houdini and vanishes. He obviously wasn't dying here, so it surely wasn't adding these to my kill count. Right? Uh, plot twist. It was. So, with that little blotch in my ledger removed, we finished chapter 13 with one kill to our name, which was nice, as we were about to drown our ledger in blood as Mike makes his arrival. Hadigan clearly didn't pass the no-kill message on to Mike, who immediately shoots questions first and asks later, committing what I can only describe as indiscriminate genocide on the island. Everywhere I went, death followed me, which was perfect, as I was obviously the one who was going to be blamed for this at the end of the chapter. I had no control over this. I tried keeping everyone indoors, useless. I tried ringing Hunnigan to call Mike off, no answer. I tried blowing Mike and the barrier up, but no luck. It is with absolute disgust that I report that we finished chapter 14 with 33 kills. Jesus Christ, that's more than the amount of people killed in the whole of Die Hard. No doubt I'd probably been blamed for Mike's death as well, F it, why not count his helicopter as well while we're at it? As we make our way into the sanctuary, a rocket comes flying through into Sadler's ancient temple, which distracts him long enough for us to grab Ashley and take her to the operating table where we burn out our plagas. There's no danger of killing anyone up until Sadler, but there is danger of killing more Novies during Sadler's boss fight. When he jumps up to the big platform and does his Dr. Doolittle mating call, his friends all have a chance to be accidentally killed in the crossfire. To prevent any accidents here, I bought one final rocket launcher from the merchant, took Sadler out immediately and finished him off with Ada's red rocket launcher. This was it, we'd freed the village and the castle from Sadler's control, and those we'd left behind could be with their loved ones and go on to lead a normal life. We sprint towards the jet ski with Ashley, but start to make a terrible realisation on the way out. It turns out that this is what Luis had been trying to warn us about before Krauser shanked him in the back. It turns out that Sadler was basically the hive mind for all the plagas, and with him dead, all the humans infected with Las Plagas were now either dying or brain dead. This was extremely awkward and uncomfortable, especially considering I'd just spent all this time trying to save everyone, but regardless, uh, I ask Ashley to just keep this between us and we make a quick exit. And to rub salt into my eyes, the chapter finishes off at three kills when it should surely just be one. Okay, just before I conclude, we're going to go back and revisit a few dubious chapters here and get some answers. I downloaded a mod that helps us to track our kills throughout the chapters, so we'll be able to tell who dies and when, and I can confirm. The extra kill in chapter 11 at the Minecraft ride wasn't this guy or Salvador, it was Krauser. The game was counting me besting him in a knife fight as murdering him, even though he's very clearly alive right here. For chapter 13, it turns out that the guy from the oven who runs out and dies is apparently blamed on us as well. And for 16, the game for some reason counts Sadler's death twice. What? Which is bullshit, and also counts this guy who bursts through the door and just falls over and dies, which is double bullshit. So, on reflection, no, you obviously cannot beat Resident Evil 4 Remake without killing anybody. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why? But here's a few ways of looking at the results of the challenge. The total kill count according to the official chapter breakdown on our playthrough was 69. Nice. 
But to lend an alternative perspective to this figure, let's break that down to who did I, Leon S. Kennedy, actually kill with my own hands? We're not including the environment or the other serial killers I unfortunately had to associate with throughout the story. This is just kills by me. Now, this sounds like some kind of weird Resident Evil version of 12 Days of Christmas, but our kill breakdown for our playthrough was Del Lago, 3 El Gigantes, Red Pajama Man, 7 Plaga Knights, 2 Garadors, 2 Dynamite Ganados on the Mines, Salazar, 1 Regenerador, Krauser, and Sadler. So with that in mind, the minimum amount of enemies you would need to kill in your playthrough should be 20 kills. I suppose there is actually a third way of looking at it, the story canon way, which was that with killing Sadler, I'd actually signed everyone's death warrant, bringing our kill counter to 1,550. I'll let you all be the judge here on which result you agree with, but anyway, that's it gamers, it's another L on this one, but this was extremely fun to make and definitely the most challenging one so far. Um, if you made it this far, as always, you're the GOAT. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you mad lads in the next video.